Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Student years are a wonderful, carefree time, but unfortunately, not everyone gets to fully enjoy this marvelous period of life. While some indulge in fun, fall in love, and build dreams, the youth of others is overshadowed by numerous trials, problems, and anxieties. Paco was one of those unlucky ones. At his final year medical university student, Paco didn't think about girls, parties with friends, or challenging exams. He was thinking about saving his ill mother. Paco's parents, Eleonora and Basilio, met when they were students, fell in love madly, and quickly got married. However, as often happens, their feelings did not withstand the trials of everyday difficulties, leading to constant quarrels. The spouses were about to divorce, but the birth of their son disrupted their plans. Young parents believed that the child would bring them closer and help them forget about all their problems and conflicts. When Paco was born, Basilio and Eleonora became so engrossed in caring for their son, who was born very ill, that they temporarily forgot about their quarrels and mutual grievances. However, over time, everything returned to the way it was, and the spouses resumed their arguments even more vehemently. Nevertheless, Eleonora was adamantly against divorce. Firstly, she loved her husband deeply and couldn't imagine life without him. Secondly, she didn't want her son to grow up in an incomplete family. A boy cannot grow up without a father. He needs a male upbringing, she used to say every time her husband brought up the topic of divorce. Nonetheless, Basilio couldn't become a good father. Paco grew up in an atmosphere of endless scandal. Peaceful days in the family were extremely rare. The father often left home and disappeared for several days, while the mother couldn't find solace and cried constantly. It wasn't until Paco finished school that his parents finally divorced. One fine day, Basilio, returning from work, packed his suitcase and left, stating that he had fallen in love with another woman. It turned out that he had been seeing her for over a year and was waiting for her to divorce her husband. Initially, Paco sighed with relief, thinking that this nightmare had finally ended. However, the young man did not yet know that the terrible events in his life were just beginning. The thing was that Eleonora took the divorce very hard, constantly torturing herself and blaming herself for what had happened. She sincerely loved her husband and deep down hoped for his return, but a few years later, Basilio passed away. The couple, along with his new wife, often indulged in drinking, which was strongly prohibited for him due to a professional illness. One of these revelries became fatal for the man. It was a huge blow for Eleonora, as she constantly blamed herself for that. Oh, if only I hadn't let him go, he would be alive now. The woman was so deeply affected by the death of her ex-husband, whom she still loved, that she suffered a heart attack and then another. As a result, Eleonora was diagnosed with a serious heart disease, so severe that she was practically bedridden. The once youthful and vibrant woman, not yet 50, had turned into an elderly woman who could barely move around the room. Doctors gave grim predictions. At best, Eleonora could live another year and a half with excellent care, constant bed rest, and regular intake of expensive medications. Only a complex operation could save her, but, firstly, it could only be done abroad, and secondly, it cost an exorbitant amount of money. For a woman living on a disability pension and her son, a student barely making ends meet with a modest scholarship and part-time jobs, affording the operation abroad was just a dream. Paco had no one but his mother, and he was terrified of losing the only close person in his life. As a medical student, he understood that a miracle wouldn't happen and that his mother wouldn't recover without the operation. He tried to get a loan, but, of course, the bank denied giving him such a large sum. What should he have done? Where should he have gotten the money? Robbing a bank was out of the question. There was nothing left but to come to terms with the terrible verdict of the doctors. Paco did his best to provide his mother with good care and somehow make her last days more positive. It was time for him to undergo an internship at one of the city hospitals. Paco had worked under the supervision of this surgeon before. It was Gabriel Alcarisa. Paco knew him well and greatly respected him. Dr. Alcarisa also had a fondness for the talented and diligent student. 
However, this time he was dissatisfied with Paco, who was inattentive, distracted, and constantly mixing up medical records, instruments, and medications. After another mistake, Gabriel called Paco into his office to give him a reprimand. Paco, you can't go on like this. We are doctors, and people's lives depend on us. What if the nurse hadn't noticed that you were giving the wrong medication to the patient? What if someone died because of your mistake? I'm sorry, I... I understand. I just didn't get enough sleep, Paco apologized, lowering his gaze to the floor. What do you mean? You need to rest at night, not to party, Gabriel reproached. I... I wasn't at a party, I was working. At this point, Paco couldn't hold back his tears, and Gabriel, in surprise, even dropped his pencil to the floor. It was very strange and unusual to see an adult, strong guy shedding tears like a child, but Paco had kept these hopeless feelings inside for too long. He had endured all these problems within himself for so long that he simply couldn't take it anymore. He needed to tell someone about his sorrow. Paco told Gabriel about his tragedy, explaining how his mother tormented herself after the departure and death of his father, how she fell into a terrible illness, and that now she was on the verge of death. The young man explained that he had to take on part-time jobs, but didn't want to quit his studies, so he worked at night. He needed money for expensive medications and good nutrition for his mother, and he was also trying to save up for the operation. But at the current pace, he would only accumulate the necessary amount in a few years, and time was running out. Come to my office tomorrow after your shift, Gabriel said. Why? Paco asked. You'll find out tomorrow, the stern doctor said, standing up from his desk and escorting the young man to the door. All evening, and then all the next day, Paco couldn't find peace. He kept thinking about why Dr. Gabriel called him into his office. He knew that Gabriel had a strict character and didn't cut anyone slack. Rumor had it that he once managed to have the son of a high-ranking official expelled from a medical university because he was untalented and constantly skipped practice. Paco thought that he might be in for some unpleasant surprises due to his absent-mindedness. If they expel me, so be it. At least I can work full-time. Everything has its advantages. The young man comforted himself before the conversation with his mentor. But it was a mistake to anticipate such a negative outcome. After listening to Gabriel, Paco felt a surge of spirit. It seemed that there was hope to save his mother. If everything worked out, he could earn enough money that would be more than sufficient for the operation abroad and even for rehabilitation in a good clinic. It turned out that Gabriel had one patient, his old friend, Remigio Flores. He was an elderly and incredibly wealthy man who engaged in criminal stuff in the 90s and acquired one of the largest businesses in the city. Over the years, he had earned a huge fortune but unfortunately lost his health. Devoting himself entirely to work, Remigio never paid attention to headaches and other ailments. He had no time to visit doctors, as time is money, as he used to say. But such carelessness led to several strokes. After the last one, Remigio was paralyzed. Actually, the elderly businessman had a personal nurse. Since he fell ill, he decided to have a healthcare professional by his side to monitor medication schedules and provide emergency assistance when needed. But now, almost helpless, Remigio dismissed his nurse, paying her a generous severance equivalent to six months' salary. The businessman was a bit shy and very principled. He simply couldn't stand having a woman take care of him, wash him, dress him, carry out personal tasks, and so on. Despite his advanced age, Remigio hadn't lost his sense of dignity, and his pride had only grown over the years. He believed that only a man was suitable for this difficult and unpleasant job. But where could he find one? When Remigio's assistant began looking through advertisements, it turned out that most caregivers were women. One man came for an interview, but he didn't pass the probationary period, as he turned out to be a heavy drinker and a scoundrel. The scoundrel attempted to steal from the wealthy old man and paid for it harshly, probably he didn't fully realize who Remigio was. Therefore, the rich man decided to seek help from his friend, the doctor. Gabriel promised to help his old friend find someone suitable at his hospital. 
He even had in mind a male nurse and a paramedic whom he intended to interview on the subject. However, upon hearing Paco's story, he changed his plans and decided to kill two birds with one stone, help both his friend and his beloved student. Of course, Paco had entirely different dreams. He had always dreamed of becoming a good doctor and opening a private clinic one day. So, he wasn't thrilled about the idea of becoming a caregiver for a wealthy, capricious old man. On the other hand, breaking his back working as a low-wage mover or as a taxi driver in a friend's car wasn't a solution either. The man did promise a very decent salary, which was simply unbelievable by the standards of the city where Paco lived. The young man clearly wasn't in a position to be picky about jobs, so he agreed, but Gabriel warned him. Hold on, don't hope too much, maybe he won't like you. I'll try to make a good impression on him, the student replied. Despite the situation being quite uncertain, Paco became very optimistic. For some reason, he felt that everything would work out and the old man would hire him. Perhaps for the first time in a while, positive thoughts filled his mind and a smile graced his face. On his way home in high spirits, he stopped by a store and spent his last money on his mother's favorite cake, intending to bring her some joy and celebrate the impending success. The next day, early in the morning, Paco headed for the interview. He left home two hours before the appointed time because he had to travel outside the city and he was afraid of being late. On the way, Paco was very nervous. For some reason, he didn't feel the confidence he used to feel the day before. Still, he remained optimistic, reassuring himself that the wealthy man wouldn't find a better candidate. Upon reaching the location and seeing the house where he would be working, Paco was impressed. It wasn't just a house, it was a three-story castle surrounded by a high, impregnable fence. He pressed the doorbell, and the gates almost immediately opened. A well-armed guard in a black suit came forward and said, Come in. Remigio is waiting for you. Paco was escorted into a spacious, bright room that stood out for its asceticism against the backdrop of general luxury. Near the window overlooking the garden, there was a bed where a thin, gray-haired man was lying. He did not look his age. Paco understood that he needed to approach closer. He pulled a chair towards the bed, sat on the edge, and stared attentively at the man without saying a word. The silent scene probably lasted about five minutes, after which Remigio broke the silence. It was difficult for him to speak, but he did it confidently and distinctly. He began asking Paco about his education, work experience, family, and future plans. The young man answered briefly, and the interviewer was listening very attentively, staring into his eyes as if trying to peer into his soul. Paco felt like the interview lasted an eternity, but in reality, they talked for no more than half an hour. Unexpectedly, Remigio interrupted it, saying, I'm hiring you, young man. You can start your duties tomorrow. Just don't be late. I don't like that. Internally, Paco was jubilant, but he made every effort to maintain a serious demeanor. Upon returning to the city, he immediately went to the university to file for an academic leave, as now he clearly wouldn't have time for studies. Initially, it was very challenging for Paco. Taking care of an almost immobile and demanding patient was inherently difficult, but the main problem was Remigio's capricious nature. Remigio constantly found fault with the young man, making unfounded complaints, as if testing him and attempting to provoke him emotionally. Paco barely tolerated the patient's whims, but he thought of the money needed for his mother's operation and it compelled him to endure and obediently please the old man. Over time, the relationship between Paco and Remigio began to improve, and one could even say they became friends. The young man and the old man spent hours talking about various topics, discussing different life situations and the latest world events. In reality, Paco spoke, while Remigio listened attentively, gazing intently into his friend's eyes. Six months had passed since the medical student began working for the wealthy elderly man. During this time, Paco had grown accustomed to his patient and had even come to love him. He no longer paid attention to the man's grumbling, and he wasn't offended by empty complaints. He found them amusing. Paco genuinely felt sorry as Remigio's condition worsened every day. 
When the attending doctor said that the man had only a couple of months left to live, Paco was deeply saddened. However, Remigio himself seemed unaffected by this news and showed no signs of fear. He understood that his time was running out and, deep down, was even glad about it because lying in bed motionless and without hope of recovery was not life but a sentence to him. So, he calmly accepted the doctor's words, but it was evident that something else was bothering him. Realizing that time was running out, he decided to have a serious conversation with Paco. I believe you've already realized that I'm a very wealthy man. I have a thriving business, several millions in the bank, real estate, including abroad, and an antique collection. Why are you telling me all this? Paco asked. I want to include you in my will and leave you half of my estate. You'll have enough not only for your mother's operation, but also for the private clinic you dream of. And if you don't want a clinic, you can simply live comfortably with this money. But I can't accept such a gift. You're already paying me a lot, Paco objected. This is not a gift. To become my heir, you'll need to fulfill one condition, marry my daughter. What? You have a daughter? You said you didn't have a family, the young man exclaimed. Remigio began to tell Paco a long and poignant story of his difficult life. Many years ago, he was not a wealthy man, but he was very happy. In his youth, he fell in love with a girl named Magda from the neighboring building, courted her tenderly, and eventually won her over. They had a modest wedding and started living in a not-so-rich apartment that remained the bride's inheritance from her grandmother. A year later, the couple had a son named Remigio after his father. Magda was unlike many other women who blamed their husbands for poverty and constantly demanded more. She endured all the hardships because she sincerely loved her husband and was happy with him, even when they had to survive eating pasta every day. As soon as their little son grew a bit, he immediately started attending the kindergarten and Magda could start working. By profession, she was a painter plasterer, contributing to the family budget. Nevertheless, Remigio found his family's dire situation humiliating. He believed that it was a disgrace for a man that his wife and his child were starving. Therefore, he did his best to earn more money, but not always by honest means. Magda begged him to come to his senses, saying that she didn't need wealth, but it was futile. At some point, his involvement in criminal activities seemed to reach a point of no return. However, over time, Remigio managed to legitimize his business, and the family lived relatively peacefully and prosperously. Finally, the man's dream came true. His beautiful wife no longer had to work and wear old, worn-out boots for years. Now she dressed like a queen, leading a vibrant social life, and their son attended an expensive private school with the best teachers. This happy family had no idea of the danger looming over them. There were many people whom Remigio had crossed paths with in the past. Numerous competitors harbored dreams of toppling the successful businessman from his pedestal. Of course, he tried to be vigilant, but his adversaries were clever and resourceful. One day, someone among them, the police never managed to find out who exactly, set up a terrible accident involving a truck. According to the perpetrator's plan, Remigio was supposed to collide with a milk truck, which allegedly accidentally started driving on the wrong side due to a technical malfunction. The crime was meticulously planned down to the smallest details, with each action time to the second. However, the criminals overlooked one thing, Remigio wasn't in the car. On that fateful morning, the businessman felt quite unwell, he had a backache and couldn't even get out of bed. Back in his distant youth, he had injured his lower back while unloading freight and the old injury periodically resurfaced. He had to cancel important meetings since he physically couldn't make it to the office to conduct negotiations. Still, business couldn't be allowed to stall, so Remigio asked his wife to go to the office and retrieve some documents. Since Magda's car had broken down the day before, she went in her husband's car, taking their son along to drop him off at school on the way. The perpetrators were unaware of all this as they set their criminal plan in motion. As soon as the car entered the highway leading to the city, a truck appeared seemingly out of nowhere and crashed into the businessman's vehicle at full speed. The woman and the child died. 
Remigio was devastated, feeling that life had come to an end. Despite the fact that neither the police nor his associates could find any traces proving that the accident was set up, he understood perfectly well that the tragedy was no accident. He was desperately trying to find the culprit and punish them, but it was all in vain. The villain skillfully covered their tracks, leaving no slightest clue. The man blamed himself for what happened, constantly recalling how his wife had once warned him to stop his dark deeds, saying that she didn't need such an amount of money. He reproached himself for asking his wife to come for the documents instead of telling his assistant the safe code and giving him that task. But all this self-flagellation was futile. His wife and son were no longer alive. One day, Remigio vowed to himself that he would never marry again or start a family. Firstly, it would be a betrayal to his deceased wife and son, and secondly, he simply had no right to put anyone else in danger. But, as it is known, time heals even the deepest wounds. Several years passed, and the pain of the terrible loss dulled a bit. Remigio came to terms with the irreparable loss and the impossibility of finding and punishing those responsible. The heart of the lonely, still relatively young man began to beat faster again when he met Nemesia. One day, Remigio's accountant fell seriously ill and had to retire urgently. He had to find a new specialist immediately, and one of the applicants for the position was Nemesia, an elegant, slender woman who resembled more a movie actress than an accountant with 10 years of experience. She didn't pass the interview, but the businessman didn't want to let her go. They met several times at a restaurant, and then passionate relationships ensued between them. Remigio was honest with Nemesia and immediately warned her that, after losing his wife and son, he didn't want to get married or start a family anymore, putting anyone in danger or worrying about someone else. He said that their relationship would be free and a secret for everyone. Nemesia agreed to all the conditions and claimed that she wasn't interested in marriage, but she wasn't entirely sincere. She hoped that over time, Remigio would love her so much that he would abandon his principles and marry her. The couple kept their relationship private, meeting secretly at countryside hotels. Only during trips abroad did they feel free and could visit restaurants, theaters, and walk hand in hand on the streets. Time passed, but Nemesia's hopes were never fulfilled. Remigio never considered letting her into his life or marrying her. This didn't change even when the woman told her lover about her pregnancy. The news didn't affect him in the way she wanted it to. Initially, Remigio was furious but didn't insist on having an abortion. He bought a large apartment in a neighboring city for Nemesia, providing her with everything she needed. He transferred a considerable sum of money to her account every month to ensure she lacked nothing. However, he never visited the woman to avoid attracting unnecessary attention from his detractors and putting her in danger. Remigio didn't come, even when he received news of the child's birth. Only after several months did he decide to visit his daughter, whom Nemesia named Lucretia after her grandmother. Seeing the little girl, the man's heart melted because she was a spitting image of him. Still, he didn't give in to paternal feelings and left everything as it was. After all, safety was paramount for him. He didn't want adversaries to reach his mistress and newborn child. Contrary to Nemesia's expectations, Remigio didn't give his daughter his surname, and the woman obtained the status of a single mother. It deeply wounded her pride, and she harbored resentment against the man, despite his generous financial support and gifts. The businessman only occasionally came to see Lucretia and give her some presents, mainly on Christmas and the girl's birthday. Lucretia fully absorbed Nemesia's anger towards Remigio. The mother roused her daughter against her father. We have no place in his luxurious life. He is ashamed of us. Naturally, the girl grew up with this resentment, and at some point, she completely distanced herself from her father and refused to see him, although neither Nemesia nor Lucretia ever rejected Remigio's financial support. The mother used to tell to the girl that it was compensation for growing up as an outcast and without a father. Of course, the businessman wasn't thrilled with such a consumer-oriented relationship, but he thought the main thing was for them to be safe. Nemesia died at a relatively young age. She was a healthy and robust woman who could have lived to a ripe old age, but due to a tragic accident, her life ended. 
At the entrance to an expensive shoe store, Namesia stumbled over the threshold and hit her head on a marble step. The paramedics, arriving within five minutes, said she was dead. The blow was precisely on the temple, and Namesia passed away instantly. The loss of her only close friend was a tremendous blow for Lucretia. Remigio tried to be there for his daughter in this difficult moment, but she pushed him away. We never were a family. What has changed now? It was challenging for the girl to be in the large, empty apartment where she had recently lived harmoniously with her mother. Therefore, a few days after the funeral, she decided to embark on a journey to recover and distract herself from dark thoughts. Lucretia went on a trip with friends. Her mother had a cousin living in Georgia. The girl decided to enjoy exploring new beautiful places and, at the same time, get to know her distant relative. After all, she really wanted someone with whom she could occasionally talk about personal matters, reminiscing about her late mother. But the meeting with her aunt didn't go very well. The woman was not thrilled with the arrival of her new relative and did not welcome her very hospitably. Lucretia understood everything immediately and didn't try to impose herself further. Since she couldn't remove her pain along with her loved one, the girl distracted herself from negative thoughts by trying local cuisine, going shopping, and going on excursions. On the last day of her trip in the new country, Lucretia decided to go to the mountains. Back in her school years, she was into rock climbing, and she was interested in testing her skills in this direction again. Unfortunately, this recreation turned into a tragedy for her. Due to her inexperience, Lucretia turned to an unverified tour agency operating semi-legally. Its staff cared only about making money, not about the safety of clients, so it wasn't surprising that the safety ropes of two members of the tour group came loose. One man escaped with only mild fright and minor bruises, but Lucretia turned out to be the lucky one. When the unfortunate incident was about to happen, the girl had climbed quite high, so her fall was terrifying. She was taken to the hospital with a concussion, multiple fractures, and the risk of internal bleeding. Lucretia had been lying unconscious for several days. Throughout this time, her father was by her side, and the insurance company informed him of the incident. Naturally, he immediately bought a plane ticket and rushed to his daughter. Thus, Remigio became the first person Lucretia saw when she regained consciousness. Despite her terrible condition and excruciating pain from fractures, the girl became angry and started driving her father away. She went into hysteria, but at one moment she fell silent and froze. For several minutes, she had been staring at the wall intently and then suddenly burst into tears and shouted at the top of her lungs. I can't feel my legs. A nurse heard this cry and immediately ran in. She gave the patient a calming injection, and a few minutes later, Lucretia fell into a deep sleep. When Lucretia fell from the cliff, she fell on her back on a rock in a very unlucky way, causing severe damage to her spine. The injury was so serious that her legs stopped working. The doctor immediately informed Remigio about this when he arrived at the hospital. The man did not immediately grasp the seriousness of the situation. Well, there must be some treatment people can start walking again after a spinal fracture. This is not the case. The trauma is too serious, and doing anything is impossible. And if we attempt surgery, it may get even worse. There is a risk that the girl will be completely paralyzed, the doctor replied. At that moment, Remigio did not take the doctor's words seriously enough. After all, he knew that he was wealthy enough so he could provide his daughter with treatment from the best specialists anywhere in the world. But sometimes wealth can't solve anything. This was precisely one of those cases. The businessman's assistant sent inquiries to various foreign clinics, but everywhere they received refusals as everyone agreed with the doctor's verdict. A glimmer of hope appeared when a renowned German doctor said he couldn't draw final conclusions until he personally saw the patient. This vague response gave Lucretia immense hope and even brought her a little closer to Remigio. The girl thought, it's good that I have such an influential and caring father. I was wrong to be so cold with him. Once I recover, we'll start anew. But there was no fresh start. The trip to Germany turned out to be entirely futile. 
After examining Lucretia and conducting some tests, the doctor only repeated what other specialists had said before him, there was no hope of recovery. Thus, after months of visiting different hospitals, it became clear that there was nothing more to hope for, and the young, blossoming girl, full of dreams and life plans, would forever be wheelchaired. After this news, Lucretia built another wall between herself and her father, and there was no hope that it would ever crumble. The girl secluded herself in her apartment, dropped out of her studies, and stopped communicating with friends. The housekeeper, who used to help Lucretia and her mother with household chores, agreed to become her caregiver, as she had previously worked as a nurse in a hospital and had the necessary skills. However, the woman couldn't withstand the difficult nature of the girl, which became even more explosive after the accident and left literally after a month. Meanwhile, Remigio was already thinking about how to ease and make his daughter's life as comfortable as possible. He understood that it was extremely inconvenient for a girl in a wheelchair to live in an apartment on the 8th floor where nothing was provided or adapted for her. Therefore, the businessman bought a country house and equipped it according to Lucretia's needs. He also hired two caregivers with medical education as well as domestic staff, a maid, a cook, a driver, and even a gardener who took care of the plot in front of the house so that the girl could spend time outdoors and admire the countless flowers in the garden. Lucretia, of course, accepted her father's help, not with gratitude, but as her due. She never once allowed Remigio to come to her home. He visited a few times, but after spending a few hours in the living room, he left because his daughter refused to leave her room and see him. In the end, the man reconciled with this situation. Maybe it's for the best, he thought, and he decided not to bother his daughter anymore, especially since the staff at Lucretia's house regularly reported on her well-being. The caregivers provided a complete report on how her day went, right down to what she ate for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Several years passed in this mode. Lucretia resigned herself to her situation, but she did calm down a bit and even decided to finish her university education by transferring to correspondence training. She also took up handicrafts and even started communicating with one of her friends. All of this happened largely thanks to regular sessions with a psychologist hired by Remigio. The experienced specialist indeed helped Lucretia overcome some fears and internal constraints, but her attitude towards her father remained unaltered. On this matter, the psychologist couldn't influence the girl, and she remained firm. Remigio finally accepted this state of affairs and no longer bothered his daughter. He only covered all expenses and made sure the girl lacked nothing. However, over time, his health deteriorated significantly. After all, age and years of neglecting himself took their toll. Bedridden, the businessman realized that his time was running out and that no one would care for Lucretia after him. Of course, his daughter would inherit a vast fortune, more than enough for a carefree life. But she probably wouldn't be able to manage it wisely, and there were so many scammers around who would undoubtedly swoop in like vultures, robbing the disabled girl without a shred of conscience. Remigio had to find a trustworthy person whom he could conscientiously entrust with his heiress. But who could that be? At first, the businessman wanted to entrust this duty to his assistant. He had worked with him for many years and had no doubt in him. However, the man was not young and not in the best health. What if something happened to him in a couple of years and Lucretia was left alone? Then he thought about contacting his daughter's aunt, the one who lives in Georgia, but he quickly rejected this candidacy. A woman who refused to communicate with her niece when she was healthy was unlikely to agree to take care of a disabled person. And if she did agree, it would probably be not out of compassion, but for the love of money. Certainly, it would be ideal if Lucretia had a husband who was young, healthy, but most importantly, honest, responsible, and reliable. But where could he find such a person? Guys could break up with healthy girls, and here was a disabled one with a detestable character. Just at that moment, when Remigio was contemplating where to find a worthy husband for his daughter, Paco appeared in his life. The more the businessman got to know the young man, the more convinced he became that he was the perfect candidate for the role of son-in-law. However cynical it may sound, Remigio decided to simply buy a husband for his daughter. 
he understood that a guy in need of money for his mother's treatment would simply not be able to refuse such a lucrative offer. Of course, there was a risk that, after receiving what he wanted, Paco would abandon Lucretia after the businessman's death. But he didn't seem like such a scoundrel, and Gabriel spoke very positively about him. In any case, Remigio simply had no other suitable candidate, and he was short on time to find one. The old man's proposal shocked Paco. Firstly, marriage was clearly not in his plans for the near future, and especially not under these conditions. Secondly, he liked another girl, his groupmate. Thirdly, he simply feared how his mother, who had heart problems, would react to this news. Paco was afraid that such a shock could be the last for the woman, and he absolutely could not tell her such news. Naturally, the young man could not affirmatively answer the businessman's proposal. In fact, the word no was on the tip of his tongue. Remigio's offer seemed indecent and even humiliating to him. He wanted to refuse the old man and leave proudly, slamming the door. But in such moments, the student always remembered the words of his favorite teacher, who taught him. Don't make difficult decisions at the moment. Take three deep breaths first. So Paco did just that. On the third breath, the young man decided not to rush things and promised his boss that he would think about it. And he really had been thinking all the way home, all evening, and then all night. Paco didn't like such intrigues and dark dealings, absolutely, but, on the other hand, the guy was in a hopeless situation. In a few months of working for Remigio, he managed to save only two-thirds of the amount needed for the operation. If Paco refused the offer now, the old man would probably fire him, and he would have to look for the missing amount somewhere else. But that was just the operation, then rehabilitation would be needed, and he also had to pay for the flight and other expenses. Moreover, Paco couldn't shake off the thought of having his own clinic. He always dreamed of it, but he understood that it was an unattainable fantasy. He would never be able to save the required amount in his lifetime, and here was such a chance. Of course, Paco did not want to commit himself to a completely unfamiliar and unloved girl for a lifetime, especially one confined to a wheelchair. However, on the other hand, he had to sacrifice something to save a loved one or to fulfill a dream. The young man pondered and weighed all the arguments until the early morning. When he finally decided to agree to marry Remigio's daughter, it was already dawn. Glancing at the clock, Paco discovered that there were still a couple of hours before the alarm and he could get some sleep. But he couldn't do it. Every time he closed his eyes, doubts crept into his mind and images appeared before him, a sick mother, a dying old man, a disabled girl. They all seemed to attack the young man, so he preferred not to doze off, but just lay there, staring at the ceiling. When Paco entered Remigio's room the next day, the old man didn't even greet him, but began to scrutinize him with a questioning look. The young man understood that he had to give an answer, but couldn't utter a word, only nodding affirmatively. At that moment, the expression on the face of the sick old man changed from tense and excited to calm and satisfied. He immediately asked to call his assistant, who arrived in about half an hour. A tall, broad-shouldered man in a strict blue suit entered the room and immediately went to the bed, showing Remigio some documents. It turned out to be a contract that Paco had to sign. It had been drawn up a long time ago when the businessman had the idea of finding a husband for his daughter. All that remained was to find a suitable candidate and enter his name. The young man did not expect everything to happen so quickly and was a bit taken aback, but Remigio had no other choice. He understood how difficult it was for Paco to make this decision and was afraid that he might change his mind, so it was necessary to have contractual obligations with him. Read and sign, Remigio said. We've already discussed everything. Why do I need to read it? Paco replied helplessly. You should, the old man insisted. The young man briefly scanned the text, learning that he would receive the first part of the money needed for his mother's treatment immediately after the businessman's death and the rest after the wedding. In case Paco refused to marry Lucretia, he would have to return the previously received amount with interest, and in the event of a divorce, he would also end up with nothing but debt. Remigio's assistant and the company's lawyers would monitor all of this. Of course, Paco had no intention of deceiving the old man, he wasn't such a man. 
Nevertheless, it was unpleasant for him to feel tied up in this way. In his soul, the young man was deeply embarrassed and even outraged by what was happening, but there was nowhere to escape. He had looked for another minute at the papers, no longer reading them, and was absentmindedly twirling the pen in his hands. Then, reluctantly, he put the coveted signature on the last page of the contract. At that moment, Remigio sighed with relief and rolled his eyes upward, as if mentally thanking higher powers for the success of his scheme and ensuring that his daughter would not be left alone. From that day on, the relationship between the old millionaire and the student was no longer as open and friendly, it remained rather formal. Paco noticeably tensed and clearly didn't want to communicate, and Remigio was no longer in the mood to talk. With each passing day, he grew weaker, realizing that the inevitable end was drawing near. A month later, the businessman passed away. Before his death, he tearfully begged Paco never to abandon or mistreat Lucretia. Despite the recent tension between them, Paco sincerely regretted the old man's death as, in one way or another, he had come to love him. But there was no time to grieve. The day after the funeral, Remigio's assistant called Paco and asked for the bank account details for a money transfer. The necessary amount for his mother's treatment had been received, and now he had to face various organizational matters. Soon, Paco managed to send his mother abroad with the help of his former boss's assistant. He had hoped to accompany his mother personally and be with her throughout the treatment, but he had other obligations. Paco's mother went abroad with her good friend, who gladly agreed to help. He then turned his attention to fulfilling the second part of the contract, the wedding. However, the reality of meeting and convincing the future bride was more complicated than it appeared on paper. Paco did not expect an easy success, as he knew from Remigio's stories that Lucretia had a very challenging personality. The young man pondered and planned his introduction to the prospective bride, but couldn't figure out how to set everything up. Perhaps it would be more appropriate to call and forewarn, but, on the other hand, if the girl knew the purpose of his visit in advance, she might not even let him through the door. Therefore, he decided to arrive without warning. One morning, Paco woke up with the thought that he was mentally prepared to meet his future bride and began to get ready. Initially, he thought about what to wear for such an occasion. Perhaps, when meeting such a wealthy heiress, he should have dressed in a formal suit. However, he quickly dismissed this idea and dressed in simple everyday clothing. Once outside, he instinctively headed for the flower shop, thinking it would be inappropriate to visit the girl without flowers. But then he realized his mistake, abruptly turned back, and headed to the bus station to travel to the neighboring city where Lucretia lived. The young man knew that Remigio had bought his daughter a luxurious house, but he did not expect it to be so grand. It was, perhaps, an entire estate with enormous territory hidden behind a three-meter metal fence. Of course, one couldn't just walk in. At the gate, a guard met Paco and scrutinized him with a skeptical look. Naturally, he was quite surprised, as hardly anyone had visited Lucretia before, especially young men. Nevertheless, he politely greeted Paco and asked, How may I introduce you? Tell her I used to work for her father, Paco said hesitantly, unsure if the girl would react well after mentioning Remigio. The guard was absent for what seemed like three minutes, but for the unlucky guest, time stretched endlessly. It felt like at least half an hour had passed, and these gates would never open again. Paco thought, maybe I shouldn't have mentioned Remigio. She probably won't want to see me, but he was wrong. The gates opened again, and the guard invited the young man to enter a gazebo in the garden where Lucretia spent her time reading. Perhaps, at any other time, the girl would indeed have driven away anyone mentioning her father. But not now. After Remigio's death, regrets tormented her. After losing her only family member, she suddenly felt immense guilt for being so cruel to her father. Certainly, in her childhood, her mother influenced her, but over time, she should have understood that everything was done solely for her safety and well-being. Now, nothing could be undone, no matter how much she regretted or suffered. When the guard told Lucretia about Paco's arrival, she was greatly uplifted. She knew that some young man had cared for Remigio and had been with him until his last breath. 
Surely, her father had conveyed some message through him. She was very excited but did not show it, trying to maintain her usual composure. Thus, she greeted the guest with a cool demeanor and her characteristic haughtiness. In reality, until this moment, Paco had never considered how he would start a conversation with Lucretia. There simply couldn't be a successful script for such a peculiar topic, so he decided to rely on intuition. Seeing the arrogant and slightly bewildered expression on the girl's face, the young man thought that it would be wrong to immediately confront her with the purpose of his visit. He decided that it was better to first express condolences and talk about the deceased, highlighting what a good person he was. Noticing that Lucretia was attentively listening, Paco thought it was time to move closer to the main subject and began to tell her his story about his mother falling ill, how he dropped out of university, and how he started working for the ailing businessman. At this point, the girl interrupted him. Why are you telling me all this? Did you really come here to complain about your tough life? You're at the wrong place. No, of course not. I just wanted you to know how I met your father, Paco explained. What do I care about about how you met him? How many acquaintances does my father have? Now everyone will come to me with their stories? The thing is that shortly before your father's death, we made a deal with him, the young man began to explain, stumbling over his words. What kind of deal? What does it have to do with me? Paco took a folder with the contract out of his briefcase and handed it to Lucretia. While the girl was examining the papers with bewilderment, he was trying to somehow explain the essence of the contract. You see, I needed money for my mother's treatment. Remigio gave it to me on the condition that I marry you and take care of you for the rest of my life. But here it says not only about the money for treatment, you decided to grab half of the inheritance for yourself, the girl exclaimed indignantly. I didn't ask for it, he offered it himself. Everything is clear. You're just an ordinary scam artist, a money hunter. Did you think it would be easy to deceive a disabled girl? Nothing will work out for you, Lucretia shouted. The girl said many unpleasant and quite offensive words to Paco, but he could understand her. The situation was indeed absurd and, at first glance, quite immoral. The young man tried to object and explain something, but Lucretia didn't want to listen. She called the guard, ordered him to escort the uninvited guest out, and never let him in again. The young man was visibly upset, but decided not to escalate the situation further, so he bid farewell and left. In fact, Paco didn't expect Lucretia to welcome him with open arms. He understood that the girl would probably take such a proposal negatively. Moreover, deep down, he wanted things to turn out that way because it would give him a reason to break this terrible contract. Paco didn't want either a wedding or an inheritance, and he planned to somehow return the money borrowed for treatment over time. Well, they won't kill me for this, he reasoned. Now, leaving Lucretia's house with his head down and accompanied by a guard, Paco was both bewildered and upset, and there were two reasons for that. Firstly, he felt sorry for the girl who, at such a young age, found herself bound to a wheelchair and spent all of her time in this gloomy country house. At her age, she should have been enjoying life, having fun, and falling in love, not sitting within four walls like an old woman. Secondly, Paco could never have foreseen that this would happen. He fell in love with the late boss's daughter at first sight. Lucretia immediately captivated him with her unusually cold beauty. If one were to assume that the Snow Queen had a real human form, it would undoubtedly be Remigio's daughter. She had refined, noble facial features and enormous blue eyes that seemed icy against the porcelain white skin. Long, light waves of hair casually cascaded down her shoulders. Of course, she was a bit rough and arrogant, but this could be attributed to her challenging fate. Nevertheless, Lucretia's eyes revealed that, deep down, she was a good person. Paco left, but firmly decided that it wouldn't be their last encounter. He was upset that Lucretia had taken him for a swindler, and he set a goal for himself, to win the girl's favor. The thought of marriage no longer frightened or disappointed him, now, this idea even inspired him. 
Of course, there was a risk that Lucretia might never love him, but now he, at least, was fully aware that he wanted to take responsibility for this girl, ensuring her a peaceful, safe, and prosperous future. Throughout the return journey, Paco thought intensively about how to win Lucretia over. When he got home, exhausted, he fell onto the bed and slept after the sleepless night and the stress he had experienced. Paco slept through the remaining half of the day and the whole night, waking up thinking immediately of the new acquaintance. He wanted to go to her, but then decided that this visit would be premature. She needed a couple of days to digest the information and cool down a bit, and he needed to calm down as well, figuring out his feelings because everything changed too suddenly. Just yesterday, he didn't know how to escape and not marry her, and now he was ready to run to the registry office at this very moment. Two days later, Paco decided to visit Lucretia again. This time, he came properly, with flowers and chocolates. However, all these preparations were in vain. Lucretia strictly forbade the guards to let the young man into the house. They didn't even open the gates, they just shouted at him to leave immediately. But at least pass on the flowers, the guy pleaded, but there was no response. He decided not to escalate the situation and just left, leaving the bouquet and box of chocolates by the gate. After that, the young man sent gifts to Lucretia several times by courier, sometimes flowers, sometimes sweets, sometimes books, or some cute trinkets. He also found the girl on social media and tried to explain himself through messages, but she didn't read a single one of his texts. Perhaps Paco was ready to give up and started thinking again about where to earn money to repay the debt for his mother's treatment of Remigio. But one night, he had a beautiful dream. Paco dreamed of running along the seashore hand in hand with Lucretia. He thought it was a sign and decided to try his luck again. Early in the morning, without even having breakfast, the young man went to Lucretia. He didn't expect much and was mentally prepared to stand in front of closed gates again, negotiating with indifferent guards. However, Paco encountered a completely different scene. While still at the beginning of the street, he noticed that the gates were wide open and guards were bustling at the entrance. The young man immediately understood that something bad had happened and quickened his pace, then started running. This time, Paco walked freely into the courtyard and immediately noticed that one of the guards lay on the lawn with a broken head. Not finding Lucretia in the garden, he decided to enter the house, where strange sounds were coming from. In the living room, maids and nurses had gathered, discussing something loudly. One of them, a very young girl, was crying bitterly and pouring some medication into a glass of water, apparently a sedative. What happened? Paco asked. The women began to tell their stories intermittently, interrupting each other. They spoke very emotionally and incoherently, so he could understand almost nothing. From all the chatter, the only thing he got was that Lucretia had disappeared, but where could she have gone? Could she have run away? And even in a wheelchair, she wouldn't have gone far. Paco realized that the women wouldn't tell him anything clear, so he needed to talk to one of the men. One of the guards told Paco that a minibus with organic farm products always came on Mondays for Lucretia. This morning it came again, although the guards didn't immediately notice that the model was different and the license plates were smeared with mud. Instead of couriers with boxes, three armed men got out of the car. Threatening with weapons, they burst into the house, seized Lucretia, and dragged her into the minibus. Everything happened in a matter of minutes, and no one had time to react properly. The intruders were talking loudly and incoherently about something, only a few words were discernible, one of which was inheritance. After he got to know this story, Paco immediately understood what had happened. Remigio's concern for his daughter's safety was not in vain. Enemies and competitors were after his wealth. They couldn't take his money and business while he was alive, so now they cynically acted through the vulnerable, disabled heiress. It was a despicable act. But did such people ever have a conscience? Did they care about others' suffering? Just a minute after Paco spoke to the guard, a police car arrived at the house. Paco decided that he must have given a statement. First, law enforcement officers listened to direct witnesses of the incident, and then Paco told them about his suspicions and what the deceased had confided in him. The police took notes, 
promised to investigate, and left. For some reason, Paco didn't entirely trust them, but he had no other choice. He needed to be patient and wait. The next morning, Paco rushed to the police station, but there he didn't hear anything promising. Apparently, the criminals were moving along forest roads where there were no surveillance cameras. They didn't know anything about the car license plates, and the criminals had masks on their faces. Practically, nothing could be done. All that was left was to wait until the criminals presented their demands. Although to whom would they present them, considering the girl had no relatives? Certainly not to the guards and maids, indeed. Only now did Paco realize how dangerous these people were and why Remigio was so afraid of them that he practically distanced himself from the family and kept his beloved daughter at a distance for so many years. They had clearly kidnapped Lucretia and not demanded a ransom. They would undoubtedly force the girl to sign some documents transferring the multi-million dollar estate to them. But what was more frightening was that they probably wouldn't get rid of the businessman's heiress. They would kill her or, in the best case, confine her to some shelter for homeless disabled people. It was clear that he needed to save Lucretia as soon as possible because ruthless criminals could do anything. But how? It was unlikely that the police would come up with anything, so Paco himself couldn't do anything because he couldn't even guess where exactly they could have taken the girl or where they were hiding her. The guards also didn't reveal much because Remigio hadn't told them about his relationships with competitors and enemies when hiring them. The young man began to think feverishly about whom to turn to. First, the assistant to the late boss, Gabriel, came to mind. Paco quickly took out his phone and called the man. However, as it turned out, he had been aware of what had happened since yesterday. He started searching for her, but so far, it had yielded no results. And suddenly, Paco had an idea. He remembered his acquaintance Ignacio, to whom he had once saved a life. This man was very wealthy and influential, but he conducted his affairs not entirely legally and moved in criminal circles. Under different circumstances, Paco wouldn't have approached him, but now the situation was desperate. Probably, no one else could find and save Lucretia. Paco met Ignacio several years ago, when he was still a first-year medical university student. At that time, he enjoyed spending weekends at the cottage, which he inherited from his grandparents. During one of these trips, there was an accident at the power station, and the electricity was cut off in the village. To build a fire and prepare some food, Paco went to collect some twigs. While wandering through the thicket, he heard a strange rustle. Initially, he thought of running back, fearing it might be some wild animal, but then he heard a faint, distressed moan that was nothing like an animal's. After carefully listening, he realized it was a human voice. Paco, having pursued a career in medicine with a childhood aspiration to help people, couldn't simply abandon someone in distress. The young man listened carefully and walked in the direction of the sound. In a small, damp ditch hidden behind thick, thorny shrubs, there was a man, all dirty and bloodied, with bound limbs and a duct taped mouth. Witnessing this scene, Paco immediately dropped the gathered twigs and rushed down to retrieve the injured person and provide first aid. It turned out the man had a serious gunshot wound, literally bleeding out, and was in urgent need of medical assistance. Paco took out his smartphone from his pocket and began pacing back and forth to catch a signal and call for an ambulance and the police. Seeing this, the wounded man began to wriggle like a snake, muffled sounds attempting to communicate. Noticing this reaction, Paco hurried towards the injured man to remove the tape from his mouth. No way. Don't call. The man tried to say more but couldn't. Incoherent mumbling followed, after which he lost consciousness. Bewildered, Paco sat crouched over the man, unsure of what to do. The fact was that he had always led a quiet life as an ordinary person and had only seen gunshot wounds in movies. All the detective series his mother loved watching flashed through his mind, and a puzzle formed in his head. If a person lies wounded in the middle of the forest, tied up, something was definitely awry. Common sense suggested that he should have called an ambulance and the police, but he listened to his inner voice and fulfilled the request of the suspicious man. Paco carried the injured man on his shoulders to his house. Fortunately, the cottage settlement was not far away. 
It was fortunate that it was already getting dark outside, and the power had not been restored that evening, meaning none of the neighbors could witness this suspicious scene and call the police. Also, it was good that the medical student had a first aid kit at the cottage, stocked with antiseptics, bandages, and even a tourniquet. What's more, Paco had brought a portable flashlight with a charged battery from the city, thinking ahead. Otherwise, he would have had to inspect the wounded man and provide first aid in the dim light of a candle. It turned out that Ignacio, at that time, Paco didn't yet know the rescued man's name, had narrowly escaped death. The bullet that hit his left shoulder exited, while the one on his right side passed tangentially. Of course, in such field conditions, it was impossible to determine if there were internal injuries, but he had to do something, stop the bleeding and treat the wounds. We'll see what happens next, thought Paco. Throughout the night, Paco sat next to the man, checking to see if he was still breathing. By morning, his temperature was higher, and Paco decided that he wasn't ready to take on such a responsibility. He attempted to call for an ambulance again, but at that moment, the injured man regained consciousness. He clutched Paco's arm as tightly as he could, pleading with his eyes for him not to call. But you'll die, Paco was trying to reason with the patient. But it was in vain. He held onto Paco's wrist for another minute, digging his nails into the skin, and then lost consciousness again. There was nothing else to do, he had to do something to save the man. It was impossible to do it with just bandages and hydrogen peroxide. Paco had to take the risk and leave the patient temporarily. He grabbed his backpack and hurried to the pharmacy for painkillers, antibiotics, and antipyretics. The nearest one was in the neighboring settlement, a bike ride of at least 20 minutes, and he also needed to stop by the store to buy some groceries. Paco took just over an hour for everything. Returning to the cottage, Paco hesitated to enter the house immediately. For a couple of minutes, he was standing on the porch in indecision as he was afraid that the wounded man might have died during his absence. He was very weak and looked extremely bad. Then he took a deep breath and abruptly opened the door. Looking at the couch where the man was lying, Paco sighed with relief. The mysterious patient was conscious and staring intently at him. I brought medicine, the young man replied to Ignacio's questioning look and began to unpack his backpack. Paco bandaged Ignacio's wounds, administered several injections, and set up an intravenous drip. Fortunately, due to all these interventions, by evening, the man felt a bit better. At least he had almost no fever, and he could speak more coherently. That's when he told his savior how his rivals had treated him because he crossed their paths. It turned out that he was involved in somewhat illegal activities, so the methods of competition in that environment were appropriate. Ignacio was about to be killed, but thanks to Paco, he remained alive. Paco couldn't stay with the patient any longer. Firstly, his mother was worried because he had never stayed at the cottage for so long. Secondly, the weekend was over, and he had even missed two days of classes. Therefore, Paco explained to the recovering patient when and what medicines to take, how to change bandages, and how to administer injections. He also bought a small supply of groceries and went back to the city. However, he was very uneasy, so every day after classes, he visited the cottage to make sure his patient was doing well. Paco brought Ignacio hot lunches. Of course, the patient would have preferred to eat delicious home-cooked meals, but he didn't dare take porridge and patties from home, as he was afraid that his mother would suspect something. Therefore, he bought food from the university cafeteria. It wasn't as tasty as homemade, but it was decent. On Saturdays and Sundays, Paco stayed overnight at the cottage, and he and Ignacio, who was getting better every day, had many conversations on various topics and even managed to become friends. The man fully recovered in about a month and a half, but he didn't leave Paco right away. He asked for permission to stay at the cottage for a couple more weeks until his people resolved some organizational issues. Paco didn't want to delve into the details, understanding that it involved some criminal matters and that Ignacio clearly intended to settle scores with his tormentors. One day, Ignacio received a call, after which he said to Paco, Well, that's it. I won't bother you anymore. They'll come in a couple of hours. 
You saved my life, so you can ask me for anything. Anyone in my shoes would have done the same. After all, I'm a future doctor, and saving people is my duty. I don't need any gratitude, Paco replied. Okay, I won't insist. But know that I owe you, and you can turn to me with any request when you need to, Ignacio said. Leaving, Ignacio handed Paco his business card with the words, Call if you need anything. Paco didn't give much importance to it, as seeking help from a gangster was certainly not part of his plans. As a simple and honest person, he couldn't even imagine that life would put him in such a desperate situation and force him to compromise his principles. However, Ignacio was now the only person who could save Lucretia. Paco rushed to the cottage, hoping that the business card was still in the top drawer of the nightstand, otherwise it would be over. The girl's life now depended on a small cardboard rectangle. Fortunately, the card was in its place, untouched or discarded, as Paco was the only one who visited the cottage. His mother disliked the place, and lately, due to her health, she couldn't physically travel there. Retrieving the musty paper from the drawer, Paco immediately dialed the number, hoping that Ignacio hadn't changed it, considering that several years had passed and much could have happened. After the third ring, the man answered, Hello. Paco immediately recognized the voice of his old acquaintance. Ignacio also recognized his savior and was delighted to hear from him. Despite having many important matters scheduled for the day, Ignacio canceled all his appointments to help Paco. An hour after their conversation, a large black car arrived at the cottage, swiftly taking Paco to Ignacio's office. The man warmly welcomed him and attentively listened to the lengthy story without interruption. It turned out that Ignacio was indirectly acquainted with Remigio. They didn't have any business together, but he knew him as an honest and upright businessman who, nonetheless, had many enemies. Lucretia's story deeply touched him, and the behavior of the criminals outraged him to the core. How despicable must one be to kidnap a helpless disabled girl, he exclaimed. Ignacio was eager to repay his debt to Paco and save the girl, who had become a victim of others' machinations. Therefore, he promised to help. From the office, they went to the house where Lucretia was abducted. Ignacio wanted to personally review the surveillance camera footage to find any leads that might have escaped the attention of the guards and the police. Then he instructed Paco to return home and wait, emphasizing that he shouldn't have taken any action. I'll call you when I find out something, Ignacio said, got into his car, and quickly drove away. There was no news from him for two or three days. Paco even began to suspect that his friend had forgotten about him or simply couldn't find any information. However, he still tried to hope for the best. Then, one morning, Paco woke up when he heard someone knocking on the door. At the threshold, he saw Ignacio who, without waiting for an invitation, entered the apartment and settled on the couch. He shared what he had learned. It turned out that the same people who had set up that terrible accident years ago kidnapped Lucretia. The son of that man, Roberto, decided to continue his father's legacy and claim Remigio's fortune as his own rightful inheritance. He learned about Lucretia's existence entirely by chance when, in a moment of distress, her father accidentally revealed himself. Roberto planned to acquire Remigio's fortune by marrying Lucretia. To do this, he intended to get to know her through a social network. For some reason, he was convinced that a disabled girl, who had likely given up on her personal life, would readily fall for anyone who showed interest. However, the proud and capricious girl immediately blocked the intrusive online suitor, foiling Roberto's plan. Realizing that a peaceful resolution was unlikely, he decided to resort to more radical measures. Aware of Remigio's severe illness and expecting his imminent demise, Roberto planned to wait until the businessman died, leaving his daughter defenseless. He intended to kidnap Lucretia, force her to transfer all the assets to him, and then send her to a remote village where no one would ever find her. Fortunately, Roberto was unaware of the agreement that Paco received half of the inheritance. Otherwise, both Paco and Lucretia would have been in danger, and no one could save them. Ignacio managed to track down Roberto and finally pinpoint Lucretia's location. 
The villain had hidden her in the suburbs, in one of the abandoned houses, guarded by two security personnel. Apparently, Lucretia had proven uncooperative and refused to sign any documents. Rather than killing her outright, which wouldn't have benefited him, Roberto chose to subject her to hunger and cold, hoping to coerce her into changing her decision. As Ignacio was telling Paco all this, his team was already heading to that abandoned house to free Lucretia. So, what are we waiting for? Let's go there too, the young man said, getting up from the couch. There's nothing for us to do there, let the professionals handle it, Ignacio dryly replied. Perhaps for about an hour, the apartment owner and his guests were waiting. Paco was nervously pacing around the room, unable to find his place, while Ignacio remained perfectly calm. He comfortably settled into an armchair, concentrating on his smartphone screen, apparently engaged in some work-related correspondence. Then someone called Ignacio. He attentively listened to the person, nodded satisfactorily, and told the young man, Now we can go. The old acquaintances quickly got into Ignacio's expensive black car and swiftly left the courtyard. They headed to the neighboring city, where Lucretia's house was located. On the way, Ignacio explained that his people had rescued the girl from the criminals, and initially, they would take her to the hospital. After all, she had spent several days in a cold and harsh environment, possibly subjected to violence, so she might need medical attention. Later, they would safely take her home. When Ignacio and Paco arrived, Lucretia was not yet there. They had been waiting for her, probably for at least an hour. The young man kept trying to go to the girl, but his friend reassured him and dissuaded him from making the trip. Finally, a car pulled up to the gates, and two tall, athletic guys got out. One of them opened the rear door of the car and carried Lucretia in his arms. Her hand was bandaged, and there was a plaster on her forehead. As soon as he brought the girl into the yard, nurses and maids rushed to her, shedding tears of joy and eagerly asking about her well-being. At that moment, Lucretia was still in a state of shock, so she probably didn't notice Paco or the stranger standing next to him. She only mentioned that she wanted to go to her room. The nurses settled her into a wheelchair and took her away to rest. It probably took at least a week before Lucretia regained consciousness with the help of a psychologist and was ready to see and talk to someone. Paco visited the girl daily, but she still treated him coldly and indifferently, not inclined to engage in conversation. However, she no longer banished him or ordered the security not to let him in, and it could be considered significant progress in their relationship. Ignacio also came to visit. He detailed the kidnappers to her, the sorrow they had caused Remigio in the past, and their plans to seize the inheritance. Ignacio reassured Lucretia that no one would dare touch her or encroach on her wealth anymore. He had arranged matters with influential people who promised to take control of the situation and deal with those hunting for someone else's money. Therefore, from now on, there was nothing to worry about. I don't even know how to thank you. Not everyone would do such a thing for a stranger, Lucretia answered emotionally. You should thank him instead, Ignacio nodded towards Paco. He asked me for help, and I couldn't refuse, as I owe him my life. Lucretia was at a loss for words, as it came as a surprise to her. After an awkward silence, Ignacio bid farewell to the girl and left. Since Lucretia clearly wasn't inclined to communicate, Paco also decided not to disturb her and headed home. The main thing is that she's okay, the young man thought as he was riding the bus. Of course, he suffered greatly from the fact that his beloved treated him so negatively and didn't even have a desire to talk. However, he decided not to bother her anymore, forgetting about the signed contract and the financial responsibility in case he did not fulfill his duties. Several days passed. During this time, Paco was occupied looking for a job. His mother, who had undergone heart surgery and was recovering rapidly, was expected to return home soon, and they needed something to live on. It turned out that no one was eagerly awaiting the aspiring doctor, and going back to university was not possible at the moment, as his scholarship was not enough to live on. Nevertheless, despite having a lot of problems, Paco couldn't stop thinking about Lucretia. When, out of the blue, the girl called him and asked him to come, his heart raced. 
In reality, he didn't expect this meeting to bring him anything good. He thought that the girl wanted to talk to him about canceling the contract. He was on his way, thinking that this would be their last meeting, yet he was very happy for the opportunity to see the girl once again. When Paco arrived, he felt like he was experiencing deja vu and mentally returned to the day of his first encounter with Lucretia. She was sitting in the same gazebo in the garden, reading a book. It seemed like she was even dressed in the same gray sweater, though her facial expression had changed. It was no longer as infantile and capricious as before, but more serious and focused. Apparently, the harrowing events had left their mark. Paco sat across from Lucretia and greeted her, but she didn't respond. At that moment, he realized that the girl would not tell him anything good, but he was wrong. I've been thinking a lot about what you told me. I mean your contract with my father, Lucretia said. Yeah, I understand that it's an absurd situation. Paco was trying to justify himself. Don't interrupt me. Just listen, the girl said sternly. I've thought about it for a long time and come to the conclusion that I'm willing to marry you. I... I can't believe my ears. I promise you won't regret your decision. The young man became enthusiastic. Don't get too excited and don't take credit for it. I'm doing this only out of gratitude for saving my life. Otherwise, I wouldn't have even let you come in. But since you helped me, I don't want to remain in debt. We'll get married formally. You'll get your money, but we won't live together. We'll discuss the details later. The girl spoke in an elevated tone. I, I understand that you see me as a scoundrel, but I promise you'll change your mind, Paco said excitedly, smiling broadly. Lucretia didn't respond to this. She looked at the young man coldly and skeptically and deliberately buried herself in her book, signaling that the conversation was over and she wanted to be alone. Paco sensed his beloved's mood, decided not to upset her, and quickly left. However, the next morning, he returned, not just like that but with bouquets and pastries. He visited her every day, trying to somehow delight and entertain her, with bouquets, sweets, soft toys, DVDs with movies, and so on. But the girl remained completely indifferent to all these presents. She still believed that he did it all not from the heart, but because it was purely calculated. When Paco showed up once again at Lucretia's with a large bunch of heart-shaped balloons, she snapped at him and drove him away. After that, he didn't appear for several days. Perhaps I went too far, and he got offended, Lucretia thought. But she was too proud to call and apologize. Moreover, as it turned out later, Paco disappeared not because he was upset with his newly betrothed. It was simply because his mother, Eleonora, returned home. It was a pleasant yet shocking surprise for the young man since his mother hadn't informed him in advance about her arrival. The last time they spoke on the phone, she mentioned that she would be in the hospital for at least another month as her rehabilitation was not yet complete. However, it turned out that they were planning to discharge her and she had already bought return tickets. Eleonora wanted to give her son a pleasant surprise and spare him unnecessary trouble. After all, he probably would have gone to meet her at the airport, which was quite far away. After Lucretia drove Paco away, he didn't immediately go home, but decided to take a stroll to clear his mind. Returning home in the evening, he instinctively looked up at his windows and was surprised to see lights in both the kitchen and the living room. Strange, I couldn't have forgotten to turn it off, he thought. Then Paco noticed a silhouette in the window and thought that burglars had entered the apartment. However, the silhouette approached the window, opened the sash, and he heard his mother's voice. Paco, run home quickly. I'm home. Paco was happy to see his mom and didn't recognize her right away. A pale, sickly woman who struggled to breathe and barely moved went abroad, but after a few months, Eleonora returned lively and flourishing. Even her voice had changed. It had regained its ringing quality from several years ago. The woman prepared a festive dinner with Paco's favorite dishes. Paco was enjoying the potatoes with meat and the cabbage pie, real homemade food that he hadn't had in a long time. Nevertheless, he was worried. The fact was that the young man hadn't told Eleonora about his contract with Remigio. She believed that her son had saved up for her treatment as he had the generous salary that the elderly businessman paid him. 
She was unaware that, essentially, for her salvation, Paco had sacrificed his personal life. And now, he needed to somehow tell his mother about the wedding. But how? She had only just recovered, and this news could undermine her health again. Yet he couldn't keep it a secret, as he couldn't hide a wedding or correct it like a bad grade in a school diary. A serious conversation was inevitable, and Paco decided that the sooner it happened, the better. He gave his mother a couple of days to get some rest after the journey and settle back at home. Then, choosing a moment when she was in good spirits, he began this complex and not entirely pleasant conversation. Paco decided not to shock Eleonora right away with the words, Mom, I'm getting married. He chose to tell the story from the very beginning, starting when he came to work for Remigio. Of course, he tactfully omitted the part about the gangsters and the kidnapping, but overall, he managed to convey the essence of the matter to his mother. Her reaction was quite predictable. Eleonora was outraged, and Paco did his best to calm his mother, fearing for her health. What does it mean to get married out of convenience? What era are we living in where a man buys a husband for their daughter? How could you agree to this? The woman exclaimed. Understand that I was in a hopeless situation. What would have happened if I couldn't pay for your treatment? Paco justified himself. I'd rather have died than recover at such a cost. I won't allow my son to spend his life with the daughter of such a shady character, especially an invalid, Eleonora continued to argue. It's too late to change anything now. But I'll never be able to repay it in my lifetime if I back out of the contract. Besides, Lucretia is a very good girl, you'll definitely like her, Paco pleaded. No matter how outraged and lamented Eleonora was, she also perfectly understood that the situation was hopeless. She didn't bless her son's marriage, but she didn't oppose it either. However, she flatly refused to get acquainted with the future bride. Why bother if you're not going to live together anyway? She said when Paco asked her to visit Lucretia. But then he decided to give up on this plan. After all, he needed to mend his relationship with the girl first before trying to introduce his mother to his future wife. His mother's return disrupted Paco's usual routine, and he didn't visit Lucretia for a few days, making him very uneasy. After all, they had parted on a bad note the last time, and he needed to address the wedding issue. In any case, Paco gathered his courage and went to his fiancée again. This time, he decided not to annoy her with romantic gestures and went empty-handed, no flowers, balloons, candies, or other trinkets. Perhaps, for the first time in their entire history, Lucretia was pleased to see Paco, although she didn't show it. Despite still not trusting him completely, she realized that she had gone too far the last time and felt guilty. Seeing him again, Lucretia felt a sense of relief. She became even more reassured when she learned that Paco hadn't come because he was offended but due to his mother's sudden return. When all misunderstandings and quarrels were settled, they could move on to discussing the wedding. Naturally, no one was thinking about a luxurious celebration with a white dress and guests. Just the thought of it drove Lucretia mad, so they decided to simply have a quiet and unpretentious ceremony. The girl asked Gabriel, the former assistant to her late father, to arrange for an official registrar to conduct the ceremony at a different location. Literally a couple of days later, the young couple got married at Lucretia's home in the same gazebo where their first meeting took place, where they had numerous conversations and arguments. The young couple even marked the occasion by sharing a glass of champagne. Initially, Paco planned to renounce Remigio's inheritance after the wedding to demonstrate the sincerity of his feelings towards Lucretia. However, now his mother pressured him, insisting that half of the inheritance rightfully belonged to him. The woman skillfully manipulated her health, saying she was feeling unwell whenever her son started to argue with her. Paco himself began to reconsider if his nobility was appropriate in the current situation. If he refused the money, he would remain a poor student. And if, in such a pitiful state, he continued to care for Lucretia, she would surely consider him a freeloader. By taking the money, he wouldn't become more attractive in the eyes of the girl, but at least he would have a chance to get back on his feet, start earning independently, and prove to his beloved that he could make something of himself. This decision was not easy for Paco, 
but he eventually went to Gabriel's office, who helped him resolve all legal matters and inherit the money. From that moment on, dreams of having his own private clinic became absolutely realistic, but first, he needed to finish his studies. Paco returned to university and began to study diligently to make up for lost time. Of course, due to his studies, there was hardly any time left for meetings with Lucretia. Nevertheless, he still tried to visit the girl at least once a week so that she wouldn't think he had forgotten about her after receiving the money. The relationship between the young man and the girl gradually improved. It couldn't be said that Lucretia completely trusted her newlywed husband, at least she no longer got angry or irritated when he visited. Eleonora, too, seemed to have come to terms with the situation. Not long ago, she didn't even want to hear about Lucretia, but now she even inquired about her well-being when her son returned from visiting her. This could be considered significant progress. Apparently, the woman noticed that her son married the girl not only due to contractual obligations, but also because he had feelings for her. One day, during dinner, Eleonora started talking about Lucretia. And why didn't Remigio help his daughter with all his money? He could have paid for the best doctors and the most expensive surgeries. He did pay, but all the doctors unanimously stated that nothing could be done because the injury was too severe, replied Paco. Really? Just the other day, I watched a program where they talked about a successful surgery in Israel on a man who had been bedridden for 20 years. They say he will walk again. Initially, Paco didn't take his mother's words seriously. The thing was, she constantly watched various fantasies on TV and then discussed them with neighbors or told her son about them when he came home from school. However, on the other hand, medicine was indeed advancing, and what seemed like fantasy just a few years ago could now be a genuine reality. Paco seized onto this thought, but decided not to share it with his wife for now. It would be wrong to give her hope without thoroughly understanding the situation. In his next visit to Lucretia, Paco decided to secretly talk to her nurse. He asked the woman to provide him with the girl's medical documents, which he then showed to his professor, who specialized in such problems. After carefully studying all the images and reviewing the conclusions of foreign colleagues, the professor confirmed their verdict. At the same time, he affirmed Eleonora's words, indeed, one of the Israeli doctors had developed a revolutionary method for treating spinal injuries. It was still experimental and being tested on volunteers, but two out of three surgeries had been successful. One man, after a serious car accident, and one woman, who fell from a window, were already taking their first steps, despite previous predictions of lifelong disability. Unfortunately, one patient died right on the operating table, but he had many concomitant illnesses plus old age, so it couldn't be definitively stated that the innovative technique was the cause of death. So, there might be hope for Lucretia's recovery if this doctor agreed to operate on her. Paco lost his peace of mind, immediately heading to his wife to discuss this serious matter with her. However, she refused to listen. Enough. I've had enough of hospitals. I don't want to go back to that nightmare and fly to the other end of the world just to hear again that I'll never walk, the girl shouted. No matter how much Paco pleaded and tried to convey that this was a real hope for recovery, Lucretia refused to listen. Eventually, she became so angry that she kicked her husband out and told him never to come back. Nevertheless, Paco was not ready to give up. He talked to Lucretia's nurses and asked them to influence her. The girl had a very good relationship with the women who had been taking care of her for several years, and she was supposed to listen to them. Of course, it didn't work immediately. At first, Lucretia still resisted and shut down any discussions about the surgery. However, over time, she, too, began to believe in the possibility of recovery. One of the nurses noticed Lucretia searching the internet for information on new treatment methods and informed Paco. That's when he realized that things were moving forward. He visited Lucretia again to talk to her about it. While she still looked dissatisfied, there was no longer aggression. Moreover, it was evident that she was noticeably excited, and a glimmer of hope appeared in her eyes. After much persuasion, Lucretia finally agreed to fly to Israel. She contacted the foreign clinic, and the doctor agreed to admit her. 
the girl was simultaneously inspired and saddened. On the one hand, she now had a chance for recovery. On the other hand, if it didn't work out this time, her disability would be final. Lucretia insisted on flying to Israel with only the company of a nurse, but Paco insisted on personally accompanying his wife. Talking to the girl about his feelings was futile. She still didn't believe that her nominal husband genuinely cared for her and was convinced of his selfish intentions. So Paco found another argument. I am a future doctor, and this will be a valuable experience for me. The clinic sent a letter stating that Lucretia was expected in a week. She didn't expect everything to happen so quickly, and she didn't have time to mentally prepare. However, on the other hand, it was better this way than spending weeks or months agonizing and tormenting herself in uncertainty. Upon arrival, Lucretia was accommodated in the clinic, and Paco rented an apartment nearby to be able to stay constantly close to his wife and support her. After all the necessary examinations, the girl underwent the operation. The surgery went smoothly, but it was too early to talk about the results. All that was left was to wait and pray. About a month later, Lucretia showed positive progress. She began to feel her legs and could even move her fingers. Of course, it was too early to talk about a full recovery. A challenging rehabilitation lay ahead, which was expected to last at least six months, if not more. Nevertheless, it could be confidently said that the worst was already behind, and the girl could finally say goodbye to the wheelchair and return to a normal life. Ensuring that Lucretia was doing well and being well taken care of, Paco returned home. After all, he needed to finish his studies, and he didn't want to leave his mother alone for too long, especially considering her recent heart surgery. Paco resumed his usual life, but connected with Lucretia every evening via video call, and she shared her progress with him. One beautiful day, she sent him a video where she stood on her own two feet for the first time in many years and even took a few hesitant steps. Paco felt a mix of happiness and confusion. He understood that his contractual marriage with Lucretia was now meaningless because she would soon recover and no longer need anyone's assistance. One day, after classes, Paco went to see Gabriel to discuss this matter. The late businessman's assistant agreed that the contract no longer made sense in the new circumstances. Paco asked for help in the process of renouncing the inheritance and preparing the documents for divorce. Thus, he came to terms with the fact that Lucretia would no longer be a part of his life and immersed himself in his studies to avoid thinking about his unfortunate love. A little over half a year later, Lucretia returned from abroad. For the first time, she entered her large country house on her own two feet. True, she still had to use crutches for the time being, but it was only a matter of time. Upon her arrival, Paco organized a celebration with inflatable balloons, treats, and guests. He found Lucretia's old friends on social media and invited them. In the evening, when everyone dispersed, he told his wife that there was a serious conversation, invited her to the gazebo, and handed her a folder with documents. Here, sign these. It's my gift to you in celebration of your recovery. What is this? Lucretia asked, casually flipping through the papers. These are divorce papers. Now you don't need me, and I won't bother you anymore. The girl's reaction was unexpected. Paco thought Lucretia would be pleased and would immediately sign the documents. However, she seemed somewhat disoriented and said, I'm not in the mood to deal with paperwork today. I'll sign them a little later and bring them to you myself. And that was how they parted ways. A few days passed since the young couple saw or communicated with each other. One day, returning home after a strenuous day of studies, Paco encountered a scene he least expected. Eleonora and Lucretia were sitting in the kitchen, enjoying coffee and homemade pastries while engaging in a pleasant conversation. Upon seeing her son, Eleonora got up from the table and said, I completely forgot, my neighbor is waiting for me. She left, leaving the young couple alone. Paco thought Lucretia had come to give him the signed divorce papers, but he was mistaken. Lucretia did take out some papers from her bag, but unexpectedly began tearing them into small pieces. Then she rushed to him, threw her arms around his neck, and hugged him tightly. 
Paco was so shocked that he didn't know how to react. Lucretia hadn't said anything kind or thanked him in so long, let alone smiled. Now, she was showing such affection. It turned out that Lucretia had long harbored feelings for him, awakening when he helped her escape from kidnappers. However, she was hesitant to express her emotions and get closer to him because she still didn't fully trust him. She didn't believe that someone could genuinely love a girl confined to a wheelchair. Now, with all he had done for her and his refusal of the inheritance, any doubts were dispelled. I love you. I don't want a divorce. Let's give our marriage a chance, Lucretia said. Paco was overjoyed. Despite being technically married, they decided to have a real wedding ceremony with a white dress, guests, music, and dancing. But before moving forward, Lucretia wanted to address one unresolved issue that had been bothering her. Since her surgery and recovery, she has found herself thinking more about Remigio. Now, she understood that her father's actions, however harsh, were solely for her well-being. Lucretia, feeling guilty, asked Paco to take her to the cemetery. Although she never had long, heartfelt conversations with her father during his lifetime, standing in front of his memorial, she expressed everything on her mind, apologized, and thanked him for giving her such a wonderful husband. Lucretia no longer wanted to live in the house her father had bought for her. It held too many unpleasant memories that she didn't want to carry into her new, happy life. She put it up for sale and quickly found a buyer. Instead, she purchased a smaller, cozier house with a bright, inviting atmosphere and a large garden full of fruit trees and rose bushes. Life in such a home was bound to be very happy. By the way, Lucretia did not choose this house alone or with her husband, who was very busy with his studies at the time. She was assisted by her mother-in-law. The woman felt ashamed of her past attitude towards her son's marriage and her biased treatment of the disabled girl. Now, trying to clear her conscience, she was very attentive and friendly towards her daughter-in-law. She genuinely grew to love her as a daughter, and Lucretia reciprocated the affection. During the wedding preparations, she became very attached to her and didn't want to part ways. Eleonora, I would really like you to live with us after the wedding. It will be more fun together, and the fresh air will do you good, Lucretia persuaded, but the wise woman declined. Firstly, based on her friend's experiences, she knew that living with young couples and their parents rarely ended well. Secondly, she was still very young and wanted to live life to the fullest. After years of suffering due to her unfaithful husband and illness, she needed to make up for lost time. Additionally, Eleonora had plans for her own future. It turned out that she had been communicating with Gabriel for some time, whom she met during his visit to her son. Initially, it was a friendly relationship, but their feelings for each other became evident. Gabriel, a man who, due to his lifelong busyness, never found time to start a family, was deeply impressed by Paco's mother. Two lonely hearts found each other and decided to give themselves a chance at happy love in their later years. The wedding was truly luxurious. Lucretia wore an incredibly beautiful dress that even Hollywood stars might envy. The newlyweds invited many guests, including friends, nurses, maids who had worked for Lucretia before, colleagues of the late Remigio, and even Ignacio. After the wedding, the spouses embarked on a romantic journey through Europe. Lucretia derived immense pleasure from this trip as, for the first time in many years abroad, she explored landmarks instead of visiting hospitals. When Lucretia and Paco returned, life continued its course. Paco completed his studies and began working at a public hospital. Lucretia decided that she, too, should return to education and pursue a profession. After a few years, Paco had his own clinic, fulfilling his dream. Lucretia managed the clinic, having by then received an education in economics, allowing her to handle complex financial and bureaucratic matters that her husband did not understand. The family business proved to be very profitable. However, the clinic demanded a significant amount of time and energy from the couple, leaving little room to attend to Remigio's business. After much contemplation and consultation with Gabriel, Lucretia decided to sell her father's business. They quickly found a buyer for the profitable enterprise, and he offered a very good price. 
The proceeds were donated to a charitable foundation aiding the disabled, ensuring that others without wealthy relatives could also have a chance at recovery and a full life. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.